One could watch that and say, well, she didn't give a clear, direct answer. That's okay, because we are not talking about clear or direct issues. How's everybody doing? My name is Anthony Brian Logan, and today we got to talk about the dumpster fire of an interview that Kamala Harris gave to Stephanie Rule of MS-13 DNC, excuse me, MSNBC. Now, before we get into it, I got a few things to say. First of all, this woman, Stephanie Rule, is a never Trumper. Unashamedly so, she's going on television to say, hey, we're not going to cover this man. We're not going to talk about the lies that he said on this town hall or in this speech or in this interview. She is solidly and openly a never Trumper. Now, on the contrary, she's pretty much pro Kamala, pro Democrat, and she's not really shy about saying that. So you already know how the interview is going to go. It's going to be a softball interview at best. I'm talking about you're getting tossed a softball right in front of the plate. And as a matter of fact, it might be a T-ball interview. Although it was that easy, Kamala still found a way to mess it up because she's just bad. She is not a good candidate at all. They could have put pretty much anybody else from the Democratic Party in there and they would have done better than this woman. But they had no choice because she was already the vice president. And this guy, Joe, can't go anymore. He can't walk two more feet on a campaign trail. So they got to put her in his place because how are you going to bypass the vice president to, quote unquote, replace the president? It doesn't make much sense. Now, before I go any further, let's get into some news clips here from the actual interview and from Miss Stephanie Rule before and after. Of course, I will link to everything in the box, but without further ado, let's go ahead and roll it. She doesn't answer the question around if the GOP is controlling the Senate, if she can't raise corporate taxes, where is she going to get the money from, is, you know, to expand the child tax credit and do all the things she wants to do? And she says, we just have to do it. And that's great. And that's a campaign promise. But 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 the issue is, if it means we're just going to borrow again then what we're doing is we're just never addressing the deficit. And back in the days when you were a proud Republican, debts and deficits mattered. Talk about now, that sounds kind of, uh, how would I say? That sounds sensible. That sounds reasonable. This was before the interview came out. All right, now let's go to what she said after the interview came out about the same issue of, you know, being able to answer questions and whatnot. Let's check it out work and one could watch that and say well she didn't give a clear direct answer that's okay because we are not talking about clear or direct issues so it's not a big problem that she didn't answer the question it's all good okay cool 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 let's see the rest of this clip then we're going to get into the other clips of kamala and stephanie's interview the the the, the question about inflation and prices this to me is one of the it's sort of one of the most frustrating aspects of this campaign the thing that people are 100% correctly wrapped work. And All right. So inflation and prices is a big thing. Let's keep on going here. All right. This is an interesting question. I'm not really sure why this would be in an interview, but hey, it is what it is. You're talking about Kamala Harris. The first one, just a fact check. Okay. Because your opponent there is almost no little every job. day. Okay. There's no such thing as a little job. Okay, fair, fair. <laughs> um, because your opponent almost every day seems to be talking about this. So I just want to ask you yes or no. Okay. At any point in your life, have you served to all beef patties, special sauce, <laughs> lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, <laughs> on a sesame, sesame seed, seed bun, bun, working at a McDonald's? <laughs> yes or no? That's it. I have. Okay. Now the other job. Now and, the other job. But it was okay. not a small job. Like, I did okay. the fries. I mean, I, you know... So the first question or a question, I ain't gonna say the first one, but a question was fact checking her on her McDonald's job when she was a child or whenever she did that. Okie dokie. So, hey, we starting off strong, huh? Taxes, raising taxes. Let's see what we're talking about here. So first of all, when it relates to anybody making less than $400,000 a year, your taxes will not go up. Your taxes will not go up. And in fact, under my plan, Taxes for 100 million Americans will actually be cut, including $6,000 a year for, mm -hmm. for young couples for the first year of their child's life in a tax cut, a tax credit, essentially, uh, that it, by expansion of the child tax credit. And why is that? Because during the first year of a young couple, of a, of a person's child's life, they're going to need help buying a crib, buying a car seat. Now, what good is a $6,000 for a one-time, one-time, by the way, one-time tax credit for a newborn baby? What good will that do 
when you're not addressing the problem of inflation, when you're not addressing the migrant crisis, do you know that we, the people in the United States of America, spend $450 billion, with a B, $450 billion U.S. American cold hard cash dollars on the migrant crisis every single year? If they're being funded by the government, by our tax money, and they're being given jobs paying lower than what we would want as Americans, what will your $6,000 one-time tax credit do to fight all that? It'll do nothing. It will do nothing. But I'm getting triggered, so I digress. Goldman Sachs uh, talking about an economic plan. Let's check this out. An agenda that includes tariffs to the point that the average working person will spend 20% more on everyday necessities and an estimated $4,000 more a year on those everyday necessities, to the point that top economists in our country, from Nobel laureates to, to, to people at, at, at Moody's and Goldman Sachs, have compared my plan with his and said my plan would grow the economy, his would shrink the economy. Some of them have actually assessed that his plan would increase inflation and invite a recession by the middle of next year. Okay, so she's saying that her plan is better than Trump's plan for the for the economy and people let Goldman Sachs back her up on it. Now, let's go down a little bit. Here's a Goldman Sachs CEO calling that lie out. All right, let's check it out. Let's talk some politics. Debate was last night. Not sure if you had a chance to see it or not. Your own economic team, of course, has made news of late, suggesting that the bigger boost to growth would come from the Harris economic plan, at least over the first couple of years. She mentioned it last night. You feel the same? So that report, which was mentioned last night in the debate, came from an independent analyst. And it's, it's interesting, Scott. I think a lot more has been made of this than should be. What the report did is it looked at a handful of policy issues that have been put out by both sides, and it tried to model their impact on GDP growth. And the reason I say a bigger deal has been made of it is what it showed is the difference between the sets of policies that they put forward was about two-tenths of one percent. Okay, so economy grows, okay, if you took these particular sets of policies they looked at, and by the way, we have no idea whether these policies, these things that are talked about will ultimately be implemented, what was the growth impact? And the differential was two-tenths of one percent. So basically, you get an independent um, group or person or whatever that's analyzing it and then putting out a report. But it's not like the CEO of Goldman Sachs came out there and said, vote Kamala because her plan is better. He's saying, well, really, when you look at it, it's not that much different. So I don't know where she's getting that particular talking point from. Now, let's continue. Uh, another talking point. She may have just learned a brand new vocabulary word because that vocabulary is uh, sorely lacking. It, it is not very voluminous. It's minuscule, very minuscule. Let's check this out. Some of the work is going to be through what we do in terms of giving benefits and assistance to state and local governments around transit dollars and looking holistically at the connection between that and housing. And looking holistically at the incentives we in the federal government can create for local and state governments to actually engage in planning in a holistic manner that includes prioritizing affordable housing. You said the word holistic three times in 25 seconds. <laughs> like, why? This is what I'm talking about. She's terrible. She's terrible, man. Like, to be able to speak and to get your point across, Kamala doesn't do it. Let's keep on going here. Madam Vice President, you just laid out your economic vision for the future. Yeah. But still, there are lots of Americans who don't see themselves in your plans. For those who say these policies aren't for me, what do you say to them? Well, if you are hardworking, if you have uh, the dreams and the ambitions and the aspirations of what I believe you do, um, you're in my plan. You know, I, I have to tell you, I really love and am so um, energized by what I know to be the spirit and character of the American people. We have ambition. We have aspirations. We have dreams. We can see what's possible. We have an incredible... Hey, check it out. Everybody got dreams. That's fine. But how are, how are my dreams going to reduce to 
price of groceries and housing and deal with the migrant crisis. How, how was that really going to affect it? Work ethic. But not everyone has the access to the opportunities that allow them to achieve those things. But we don't lack for those things. But not everyone, you know, gets handed stuff on a silver platter. And so my vision for the economy, I call it an opportunity economy, is about making sure that all Americans, wherever they start, wherever they are, have the ability to actually achieve those, those dreams and those ambitions, which include for middle class families, just being able to, to know that their hard work allows them to get ahead, right? I, I think we can't and we shouldn't aspire to have a, an economy that just allows people to get by. People want to do more than just get by. They want to get ahead. I mean, but this is just what's a word salad. This is what she does. It's always word salad. It's never anything concrete. It's just language that may sound flowery to uneducated people. That's what I hear. Maybe y'all hear differently. Let me know in the comments. Let's keep on rocking and rolling. All right. Talking about the tariffs. I don't really want to talk about that one. The price. Remember, she said price gauging. She didn't even know what the word, what the phrase price gouging meant up until a few weeks ago. Let's check this out. Prices mm -hmm. are still hot. Yeah, I agree with you. You said you want to take this on mm -hmm. by going after those who engage in price gouging. Yeah. But as somebody who supports free markets, who's a capitalist, how do you go after price gouging without implementing price controls? Because once we get in this zone, people start to get worried and they say, I don't know what she stands for. So just to be very frank, I am never going to apologize for going after companies and corporations that take advantage of the desperation of the American people. And I, as attorney general, I saw this happen. But how do you really gauge that? How do you really know if a company is price as you said, gauging, gouging is the correct term. How do you really know that? Like, what will you base that on? How can you control it? How can you actually enforce any kind of rules against what you consider to be price gouging? And who's going to be the grand arbiter of what this practice is or is not? In the midst of an emergency, whether it be an extreme weather event or even the pandemic, we saw it. Where those few companies, not the majority, not most. But those few companies that would take advantage of the desperation of people and jack up prices. Yeah, I'm going to go after them. Yes, I'm going to go after them. There's no way for you to really enforce that in, the, in a serious way without having price controls. And we know what price controls are. That's part of communism, socialism. And the end result of you trying to put price caps, price controls, it's going to be shortages. You're going to make life worse for Americans Although in your mind and in the minds of some simple people, you're doing a good thing. Okay. But you're not doing a good thing. Of course, I will link to all those clips in the full interview in the box. If you really want to check it out. But as I close, I want to say this shout out to everybody that sees through what she's talking about. This plan of hers, if you want to call it that is not going to be a good one. It's not going to be helpful for us as Americans, quite obviously, but I think I'll leave that right there for now. And what say you? What's your take on the Kamala Harris MS-13 DNC interview with Stephanie Rule? Was it a good one, bad one? Did you learn anything? Were your previous assumptions about Kamala confirmed? Whatever your thoughts are, let me know in the comments below. You guys know where I'm at. This was a dumpster fire. Uh, really bad. Um, I guess she was able to speak okay. She sounded better than Joe Biden, who pretty much got two feet in the ground. She sounds better than him, but I'm not hearing anything right here that would convince me of her ability to be a great leader in this country. But if you think differently, please, please, please let me know in the comments. But whatever your thoughts are, please let me know in the comments below. And that is all I got to say for this video. If you like what you heard, please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.